the people who listen to your show, they come to you guys because you're going to help them understand what it's like to found companies so they don't have to trip over the same rocks you did. And so I'm assuming that's why I'm here as opposed to this is the way you negotiate the best valuation XYZ, or this should be your balance between marketing spend, the time you spend in product management, whatever. We can talk that too, but I think people get the most value. The lessons you guys probably wanted to learn when you were started would be things like this. Don't think you're right. Realize that no one you're going to sell to is as smart as you are about the thing that you know. You've got two choices. You can try to convince every single person in the marketplace that you're right and more than they do, or you can meet them where they're at and find out what they actually want and translate your vision into something they want to use. The water's fine, homie, jump into the deep end, so it you will reap it. We're talking how to start it, how to grow it, how to keep it. Take a deep breath. You are now rocking with Founder Secrets. All right, so Jack, tell- let's hear an amazing mustache story. <laughs> I had the good fortune to be on Bloomberg following in or in the middle of one of the RSA conferences, probably about a decade ago. And uh, there's a whole story behind the mustache we don't have to get into. But we got into it in the course of that discussion with the reporter because finished the interview section, which is about new technology and security and this and that. And he said, Jack, my audience really wants to know what's up with the mustache. So we go through this whole story and it's fine. It's funny. So you're on Bloomberg and that happens. What was best was when he threw it back to the host of the show, right? The guy says, and I got to tell you, that's a hell of a mustache. And so they went back and forth talking about the mustache for perhaps over the course of time, the amount of time I've done in television, the thing that it's been most discussed is not my opinion or my experience or my thought process. It's my mustache. (laughs) There you go. I love it. I love it. What a great intro, especially (laughs) for those who can't see it's a fabulous mustache. But yeah, I know Jack, you have a, you have an amazing career in entrepreneurship and founded several companies, sold several companies. I'm just curious, like, can we start with a high level? Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Like, how did it start? And then how did you end up where you are today? Sure. Great. And for the audience's perspective, I work in cybersecurity and I have for basically since the rocks were hot, I got my first patents and work I did in the late 1980s. And it's actually germane to how I got into entrepreneurship in general. But no, I never thought about this. I'd been working since I was pretty young. I always worked pretty hard at whatever I had to do to get it done. And I was fortunate that I did relatively well in school. And so when I left high school to go to college, I picked a college where it had 100% employment in a single major, which happened to be computers. So welcome to computers. I'm not one of those folks who was home working, building his own computers in the early 80s or any of that business. It was not me, although I admired those kinds of people. I think constitutionally, I would have been probably an English professor or an English teacher in a high school. That was probably where I would have gone more than likely. But no money in that, so off we go. I came out and began working a couple of different places in the Unix operating system. Became an operating systems engineer, just loved it. And that morphed its way into the early days of internet working into a thing called the distributed computing environment, CE, which was shared client server computing before the internet was a thing. And it's 150 calls to set up a single connection between point A and point B, that kind of stuff. And the DCP had challenges with security because machine A would be trusting that machine B was machine B. How do you do that in an era before anything like SSL ever thought to exist and mostly with symmetric key stuff, it's hard. At the same time, how do I know, Taylor, that your time zone is the same as Flavio's time, uh, Flavius time zone? How do I do these two things together? And I try to get these conversations together so that your expired credential isn't now still working out okay where he's at. And so security became a thing. It became part of being an operating system and kernel level sort of distributed computing kind of guy. And so that was great. And then the internet popped up. Hey, welcome to the internet, right? And I got recruited over to BDN, the folks who invented, it's both Berenik and Newman, the folks who invented the at sign, interesting enough, right? And did the first implementation of TCP IP back in the early days, right? And so these were really smart folks. And they're like, security is going to be a thing. Why don't you come and build a managed security service around it? And they've done some early work in it. But then we built out a thing called Site Patrol, which is like really the first big cybersecurity service, MSP, ever. And it was at a time when the technology was such that ordinarily you couldn't control devices on other ISPs networks, right? And so in Site Patrol, because folks would have different connections to different places, I actually used acoustic modems like I would dial into and regular modems to dial into that had power off switches on them. And so I could turn off the power if they were under attack someplace that I couldn't control the machines. Make a long story short, I'm working on all that. And this young upstart company comes in to help us do a better job of managing security. And it was a guy named Glenn McGonigal who worked with a guy named Chris Klaus. 
So for those of you who are not security dinosaurs, these guys created, Chris was the founder um, of ISS, the first really big, really robust cybersecurity company. And I remember Glenn would show up and Glenn was his head of business development. Glenn would show up and he just worked his ass off building up this idea and this culture and this business around cybersecurity. And they really changed the way the world thought quite a bit. And it was that that inspired me to go do something. I watched Chris Claus, brilliant, Glenn, brilliant, super hardworking and developing business. And they were actually changing the world uh, because of what they were doing. And it made me understand that sometimes if you want to change the world and help people in a really significant way, you're going to have to do it on your own because it's really hard to change the world if you're in the middle of somebody else's dream. So for me, that was the real inspiration. It was Gonagal, it was Klaus, it was ISS. Can I ask? Nice. Go ahead. What in any way incorporated teaching along the way? It sounds like one. What's that? I think it's, if you look around, right? I write a ton. As I say to people, I've got a, a dozen or more patents, right? So I do geeky stuff too. But I think the very most important thing I do is stuff like I'm doing with YouTube gents right now. And I do it a lot about cybersecurity. I help people understand that this real blown hyper technical challenge of cybersecurity is a tractable one. I think that my mission in life is to help people understand that just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. And frankly, it doesn't have to be as hard as some people will tell you that it is. And so that proclivity for language, right? That urgency I have to communicate, it just translates itself in a different way. And especially as you guys know, as entrepreneurs, one of the most important things you can do is to help other people understand your vision, whether you're talking about your investors or your employees or your potential clients inside the market, understanding how to frame what you're doing and why it's important in a language that they'll understand is probably the critical thing that divides technologists from successful technologists who make the jump into being entrepreneurs. So this is something I've struggled with recently, actually, is how do you measure, like, what's better, an impact? You talked about making an impact in teaching, and so I always wonder, like, you could make a small impact on a wide number of people, like, say, through security, maybe protect millions of people's data, or you could teach four or five people and have an immense impact on those individuals and in their lives. And I struggle with this recently. I wonder how you think of how you think of impact and how, how that matters to you. Sure. Look at the two of us, right? Aside from our devilish good looks, what are we bringing to the party, right? That other people won't necessarily have. There is a lot of people out there who were at least as good at speaking the English language as me. There are not that many people who've dedicated more than three decades trying to solve the same problem, right? Haven't succeeded yet, but what the hell? It took, it's taken Kushak longer than this, and he's passed away now to build out the Crazy Horse statue on the mountain in South Dakota. I'm not the slowest guy around, but I think my unique value is I've spent a lot of time about a problem that I care about, protecting people in a way that I care about. And I love the numbers that you use because it's right on the money, right? At New Harbor, where I am now working with Justin Finley, we are actually protecting tens and tens of millions of people to the work we do in trying to protect state and local government. I like to think, they, I'm sure they could find somebody else, right? But I like to think in the back of my head, those people's votes will be counted, their health care will be provided, the emergency services will show up because I'm working my ass off every day. So I think that me as an individual, or maybe you as an individual, by doing the work that we do to change things that we're particularly good at, we make the biggest impact we can on the broadest number of people. But that's a calculus we have to think about every day. If you get to the end of it and you're just like, I'm sitting on top of the mountain now and I'm really not that good anymore, but hey, people like me, then maybe you ought to do something else, right? But if every day you're still wrestling things to the ground and you're still learning new stuff, so you maintain the best voice you can to help those people, as many as you can, then I think you're doing okay. It, it seems from your story that you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you stumbled into cybersecurity in a way, right? You stumbled into security. And so do you think that there's a chance that in a different life, if you had stumbled onto something similar, that you would have doubled down and done it for as long as you have and gotten as good as you, as you are now? Or is it something magical about security? That's, that's a really thoughtful question, Taylor. I think it is something special about security. As a kid, I wasn't the self-possessed individual see chatting with you now, right? I had a patch over one eye, not very athletic, very small, super small. What a patch, like a pirate patch? Yeah, when I when you're I got I've got a thing wrong. One of my eyes does basically doesn't see. This one doesn't work. Oh yeah. And in the 1960s, excellent. What they would do is they'd say, "Let's try to make that better. We'll put a patch over your good eye." So what we're going to take is we're going to take this really smart, geeky kid. And I think what we'll do is we'll put a patch over one of his eyes, the one that works, so he can go to school and experience that because that'll be freaking excellent. 
without, without going into details, you can imagine the kind of treatment I was subjected to. And it continued for a long time. As I was coming through the end of my, my high school career, there was a fellow there who was a football coach, but just a really nice guy, later went on to be dean of students. And there was a kid in my neighborhood who said, you really are still lifting weights because I need somebody to lift with and what the hell have you got to lose? And so I gained 40 pounds. And, it, and that changed my attitude, right? I was, trust me, I'm no longer getting picked on. But I also was not going to become the picker honor. I wanted to protect people from that experience because it sucks, right? And to tell it to your question, I'm in technology, right? And I don't know if I'm, I'm going to say I discovered it. It's like stumbling, but it feels more assertive, right? <laughs> but I discovered cybersecurity because really good people were getting hurt by people who were attacking them. And all those people had was bigger muscles. They were, cyber, they were like cyber muscles, right? They were brain muscles but they were really hurting people. And in the early days, they were hurting people in hospitals. They were hurting people and making them lose their jobs as systems administrators because people didn't understand how hard this was. And so for me, it was the right problem for me to solve, right? It was the right problem for me to solve because I want to protect people. I want to help people. I never want anybody to feel that. So I think I, I did, I, I stumbled into it, but I stumbled into something that was uniquely suited to the way I wanted to help the world. Love that. I want to switch gears a little bit. You sure you started. I want to make sure I'm saying this right. But you started at least three companies that were acquired. Is that right? Yeah, I started three companies, all of which were acquired. Yeah, can you? That's an extremely rare trait. Can you kind of speak to? Was that the goal in starting each one, and kind of how did that work for those three? <laughs> for the audience, I think that one of the lessons I tell you is that stats, right? Damn lies and statistics. I started the first company out. And when it's your first company, as you guys have been through, right, it's all super exciting, but you make so many mistakes, right? I think that my chief value when I have conversations like this or through the auspices of my friends in venture to help them with young companies, I'm mainly telling people how to avoid eating as much dirt as they likely will without some advice. I made just about every mistake you can imagine, and we can do a litany of those in another episode. But no, I didn't build the companies to be bought. I, in many ways, as I stop and I think about it, I misunderstood until I got bought. So the first company did kernel level security at a time when nobody was thinking about kernel level security. And we built the product a great team over in WatchGuard said, Hey, this is really interesting. We'd like to do something like this. They picked us up really early on. We had $1,100 in revenue or something, but that was 2000 and the world was different then. And my, I was really excited because it was a great team there and I got to work with them. It's still a great team, but I, and I got to work with them. But that acquisition was a result of me not really understanding how much bigger the company could have been, not understanding all the lessons I would have learned by continuing to do it. All I knew was coming from my own background and working really hard. It was amaze balls for me that somebody was like, this is for you. If, if I give you this, will you give me your company? And I was like, oh yes, I will. But I hadn't thought enough about it. And it wasn't, and it wasn't the right deal either, right? It, it was a great company, a great acquirer, but they weren't a software company. They were mainly a hardware company that had some software. And so it was a hard home and it was a lot of difficult times, both for the team over at WatchGuard and for our own team in making these things come together in a productive way for the customer. Acquisition number one, Really exciting, but probably not the perfect fit. My acquisition well, number okay, one, right on, on yeah. one real quick. Uh, how did that happen? You said eleven hundred dollars in revenue, so yeah. yeah, per year or total? period. Yeah. And so, how did the acquirer even find you? Interestingly enough, right? WatchGuard at the time had one of the first, and I think the best firewall appliance. So remember, this is nineteen mid nineteen nineties, late nineteen nineties, when I met them. And I had actually brought them into my site patrol environment um, at BBN because it was a great piece of equipment, really technically advanced specifically at the time. And so when I started my own company up, I'm like, I don't want anybody stealing my stuff. So I called the CEO and I'm like, dude, it's me. Hey, can I have one of those firewalls? And he said, well, what do you need that for? And I said, because I started a company. He goes, oh, really? What are you doing? And I said, this thing. And he said, why don't you come show me this thing? So I flew out there and I showed them the technology. They had their head of security installed on the machine. I said, yeah, go ahead. Try and get it off. Try and turn it off. And at the end of the day, yeah, it didn't happen. And they said, okay, we'll buy your company. And it's more complicated. There's more of a dance, of course, than that. But that's basically what it was. They, the team I had, guys like Ryan Berg that, that had been with me forever, right? These are really smart people. And so I think they knew that we had, we probably put to sub, together something useful. And they were looking to expand what they were able to help their clients with. And so it just made a logical. And at that point in time, the valuations of the market was relatively, I'm assuming, from their perspective, a low-cost acquisition. So that's how that happened. 
It's all, it's also, it's a good question too, because it's also about the network. Yeah. It seems like you were open to saying yes and flying out there and entertaining it, even though it ended up is in hindsight, maybe not being a good deal. I think you were open to it and, and in a sense, you built a quality product and they came. So that's almost counterintuitive to the advice founders <laughs> often get. So yeah, let's move on to the second one. How did the second one get? So the second one, so we go to WatchGuard with this technology that will block anything that's trying to do something bad. Context switch, people trying to change your website front page while it's operating, people trojaning out your binaries, all these security things that happen all the time. And we instantly break everything, right? We realize that all the applications that exist in the world are written in a way that is completely insecure and horrible. So we're like, if we're going to change the world, then we got to fix these applications. So we start doing some analysis of how you can identify these problems in cybersecurity at compile time. Basically, as people writing the source code, what errors are they making that we could help them find so they don't get vulnerable in these ways? And so we started on Slaps. That was the application scanning company. So basically, you jam your code in the front end, it would mill on it, and it would throw out a result in the back end that tell you all the vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities that it had found. A lot more complicated than that, but really interesting and a great way to move the cybersecurity problem left, move it back. And then the problem. customer's responsibility would be to implement those recommendations and secure their website. Yeah. Think about it like a compiler, right? So in, in the old days when people had to compile code, right, you would run your compiler and it would look for errors, it would look for mistakes, it would look for unattached things or libraries you haven't linked in. And it would say, hold on a second, I'm not ready yet. And this is just like that. It was like a compiler error, but it was like, hold on a second, security problem. And then you'd be like, oh, I better fix that. And it also allowed the security team to have some sense for the errors that were being found. So they could say, listen, that one's super important. The other one, eh, we can get let that go by or we can mitigate it with another kind of control. So that was pretty excellent. But here we go again, spoonful of dirt, ladle full of dirt, shovel full of dirt, I have to eat, right? Because I'm like, this is a security person tool. Excellent. And we make a tool that identifies every vulnerability, every potential vulnerability, all this information. And every time somebody runs it, we give them Encyclopedia Britannica. Hey, everybody, here's all your problems. Got to go, right? That was probably not the right marketing messages. We were competed in the market with a company that came slightly after us called Fortify. Fortify was created mainly by a brilliant investor at Planet Perkins named Ted Schlein, just brilliant. And uh, he's a great security background on his own. And he recruited a really good security team to solve a problem in a similar way, but smarter, right? They would analyze it and they would just throw up like five things to fix. It's all, I'm, it's hyperbole, right? It was more than that. And they were better than that, but it was like five things. And it's like, hey, if you fix these five things, you'll be more secure. And he was right. They would be. But if I have a choice between being more secure and having to eat the Encyclopedia Britannica or being more secure and having to eat this post-it note, I'm going for the post-it note, right? And he also understood much more about sales and marketing than I did. And so in the marketplace, we were up staff like 10 to 1. Because so I'm like, make the technology better. It'll be excellent. And we're, now we're struggling along. Now, fortunately, I had brilliant people working with me and on my board who had been previously associated with the IBM team. And I like the IBM product suite. I always had. I think it's I think it's a great company. And we had built early on as partners with Rational, which was their IDE at the time. And we decided it was time to do something else. And IBM's like, hey, you guys, what do you think about this? And we said, I think that's excellent. We can change the world because IBM, you're an aircraft carrier. You're going to help lots and lots of people. And at the time, I thought, well, look at this. If I want to change the world, we're better, right, than being inside IBM because everybody's IBM. And so that worked out great. And that's how IBM bought your company. Yes, IBM bought that company. At the time, they didn't have a security division. We were bought into the Rational Development Tools Division. And it was actually through the auspices of a gentleman by the name of Steve Robinson, Mark Van Zedelhoff, who's now the CEO over at Devo. How did you, uh, IBM being so big and you being relatively small, how did that even start? The it's a security marketplace thing. Everybody's small. Until you're really big, everybody's pretty small. It's a niche vendors thing. If you go to the RSA conference, there's 800 or a thousand companies and most of them you can fit in a thimble with room for a thumb, right? They're pretty small. And so good companies, the fellow who owned sort of corporate development acquisitions and stuff for the team at IBM was a guy named Mike Laurie, just brilliant. And he always had his ear to the ground. And so they're like, hey, this, and with the help of America's Growth Capital, a woman by the name of Marie-Louis Kuzma, also brilliant. They hooked us up and it worked out just great. It worked out just great for us. Get in there, change the nature of the way that worked. Okay. What about the third one? 
Oh, the third one. <laughs> yeah, back up the dump truck for this one. We So we fix application security. Not, but had an idea. Fix kernel obscurity. Idea. I thought you but, said you made all of your mistakes in the first company. So then on, by the third, you should have been flawless. <laughs> oh, brother, if I start the fourth company, I'll have a whole new range of mistakes to make. 100%. No one can make all the mistakes that are to be found. So anyway, and the, so the first company mistake was not really understanding value, not really understanding marketplace, not really understanding path to market and channel. Second, second problem was not understanding deeply enough the real client, the real customer, the real value you were providing and focusing instead on where you thought it should go. So real awareness of the importance of product market fit in the second company. Third company made that stuff behind us. And we're like, hey, everybody, let's go. We're going to use ML and AI to actually analyze behaviors of processes when they spin up, when they first start running on your computer, because malware looks different than good software. And at the same time, the construction of it's different. So you can do what's called characteristic analysis and behavioral analysis. Now, again, it wasn't my idea to apply ML and AI to it. The fellow I mentioned earlier, Ryan Berg was one who said, so much data, right? 135,000 new attacks every day. We got to use basically data science to work our way through that. So work through, create an endpoint agent, in we go, right? There, our lead investor, unfortunately, part of a really huge firm, he passes away, right? And he had been a super strong champion, young, healthy, it's super tragedy, right? He passes away. And now there's nobody really left inside that, that organization really understands why we're so excited about this issue. Second thing that happens is that the market itself gets super crowded super fast. We started about five minutes after Silence and CrowdStrike and Carbon Black and Sentinel One, but nobody had said anything yet, but they had been working and working. So now we're like, hey, we're really awesome. And they're like, yeah, but. 15 minutes ago, these four companies popped out and they're huge. And so suddenly trying to find oxygen in that marketplace was really hard. And so we were super struggling. And what ended up happening was Alert Logic, which is one of the big MDR companies. Now, since then, they've been bought by Help Systems, now Fortra. The CEO, Bob Lines, I understand you have some really interesting ML stuff and you have an interesting endpoint. We've got lots and lots of customers, lots and lots of folks coming through. We'd love your expertise in the analytics to work with all the monitoring information we get. And we'd like to be able to do more about gathering information off the endpoints. So we're like, excellent, let's do that. And so we were acquired by Alert Logic in 2019. But and the lesson there was sometimes you just don't know, right? Sometimes you just don't know what's happening in the market. And I think if we had been smarter about it, we could have pivoted earlier. But it's hard as a founder to literally, you have to cut off some of your value. You have to intentionally leave half the meat behind and just use half the meat that you remaining. And that's really hard when there's real value in that other piece, but the market doesn't necessarily, and the customers won't necessarily value it or see it as unique as you see it in competition with other players in your own market. So again, it's a market fit question. Did you have revenue at the point you saw with this last one? Did you have Oh, customers? sure. Yeah, both those other two companies had reasonable revenue. It's not tons of revenue, but reasonable revenues. We had hundreds of thousands of machines running the Barclays stuff, and Ounce Labs was in probably, I don't know, but maybe you, 5 or 10% of the Fortune 500. And you felt that it was hard to acquire more because there were so many other companies in the space you were competing with that were more capitalized. Than yeah, you. Hun yeah, 100%. And they had more time to establish their brand. And so... We went in doing a very unique form of machine learning, right? Basically doing unsupervised training to recognize the unique behaviors of malware for a system. But if we went out and said MLAI, they'd say, oh, silence? You're like, no, but then it's, why are you different? And try explaining to someone the difference between feature extraction, characteristic analysis, and learning in a clustered system about behaviors in an early, early runtime. You know, six people care. It's strange that if you told most people, hey, you sold three companies, you would think, that's amazing. It's all positives. You must be a billionaire. You characterize these three exits almost as not a positive. <laughs> oh, no, I, I hope it's been clear that what I'm trying to say is that I want to make sure that people don't think exactly what you said at the top, right? Which is, wow, look at this great successes. Honestly, these are all learning experiences. I swear to God that some of the venture guys I know who hooked me up with their small companies are just so I can tell them not the mistakes to make. And yeah, and honestly, these were great outcomes. The teams I worked with at WatchGuard and at IBM and the work I got to do over in North American security service delivery for IBM, that was pretty awesome. Tons and tons of really smart people getting the job done. And the acquisition by Alert Logic, it was the first time I had dealt with a private equity company and Bob Lyons, brilliant CEO. I learned a shit ton, right? So every five minutes I'm learning something new. So these were all awesome exits. As long as you define the awesome exits, by the way, we started the show off, right? 
It's my job to try to help people, to protect people in ways they can't protect themselves. And every time I learn one of these lessons, I start protecting them in a different way. And if some small part of the market has learned something by something that I've done, and now they're helping people better in a different way, then I think that kicks ass. So they have been huge successes, they, they, but they're not, you don't, I don't think about characterizing them financially. It's just, how could I have done things differently? Because the people who listen to your show, they come to you guys because you're really smart. And you're going to help them understand what it's like to found companies so they don't have to trip over the same rocks you did. And so I'm assuming that's why I'm here as opposed to this is the way you negotiate the best valuation X, Y, Z, or this should be your balance between marketing spend, the time you spend in product management, whatever. We can talk that too, but I think people get the most value. The lessons you guys probably wanted to learn when you were started would be things like this. Don't think you're right. Realize that no one you're going to sell to is as smart as you are about the thing that you know. You've got two choices. You can try to convince every single person in the marketplace that you're right and more than they do, or you can meet them where they're at and find out what they actually want and translate your vision into something they want to use. I promise you, method B kills method A, but most founders are going to go with method A because they think they have to be the smartest kid in the block to get people to buy their stuff and they don't realize it. Lesson one. I think it's also an element when you're first starting out that we don't know how to sell, right? So maybe somebody listening to this is the equivalent of what you're talking about, that they technically know that their product is better and maybe they're right and they're very smart and technical in that way. And they speak to the technical reasons on why it's better. Can you speak to that around, because you're obviously quite technical yourself. Like, how did you get those first couple of customers early on? Like, how did you walk that line of not just over-talking yourself technically? How did you actually convince them to buy from you when maybe you didn't have other customers to talk about or whatnot? Sure. In I think in any industry, but particularly in cybersecurity, if you can persuasively solve a problem that they all understand before you show up in the doorstep, it's the best way to go. So in cybersecurity, there there are an infinite number of problems that people understand. You can show them an attack, right? You can simulate ransomware. You can point them at an attack and here's the actual component that made it happen. Now watch what happens when I apply my magic sauce. It doesn't work anymore. Right. So particularly in the early days, that was pretty key. I used the example of talking with the team down at WatchGuard when they were looking at that product in 2000 or 1999, whatever it was, and they're looking at it. I put it in their hands. And so they executed all the attacks that an attacker would use to get around it onto that system. And they couldn't. So I demonstrated value, not by explaining to them how kernel level shims work, not explaining to them how I'm doing filtering and setting up operational administrative modes for the technical gobbledygook. I said, the concern is that bad people will get on your machines and do bad things. Here's a piece of software that'll keep bad people from getting on your machines and doing bad things. And they tried it. They're like, dude, that's pretty cool. Bad people can't get on this machine. Winner. Same thing with the application security stuff, right? Like I say, you're about to deploy this application. Yes, we are. I said, hold on a second. Let me run it through the x-ray machine. And I bet I can show you some things that are still broken that people can take advantage of. And I'll also tell you how to fix them. Oh, now did I have to tell them about intermediate representations, compiled language maps, all of that? No. I just had to say, here's your application you're about to release, and a monkey could have broken into it. Excellent. I think I don't want monkeys breaking into my machine. And so it's all about demonstrating value, meeting them where they're at. There's a certain element I'm curious of fear that your that this particular domain needs to generate a sale, right? The customer needs to have the fear, like a very strong fear that if their system's compromised, bad things will happen. And it's, I'm wondering, like, yeah, to what extent do you just spend a lot of time really drilling that fear into them so that at the end of the day, you're like, hey, I have the solution. And it seems like a very fear-based sale. Yeah, I should send you money because I love this question because I don't do any of that. None of that. Because fear is the reason people don't do anything in cybersecurity. They are so afraid. And so many vendors inside the market, it's called fear, uncertainty, and death, FUD. And that's how people sell cybersecurity. And if you can convince everybody that everything is super dangerous, what do you see happening? Like, right, when when a big animal attacks a smaller animal, the smaller animal pretty much falls into the fetal position and gets gobbled up. That's what humans do. Human nature is to avoid confronting what they feel is an intractable problem. My job is to help them understand these problems are tractable. To say, listen, you're hearing all this nonsense about how horrible everything is. Honestly, not that bad. If you look at all the attacks that happen, the root causes of them, not rocket science. It's not somebody using quantum resistant cryptography breakers, right? It's like, blah, 
No, it's that the poor end user was allowed to click on something they shouldn't have. And then they jumped outside because an email got through that shouldn't have gotten through. Well, let's think about it. That technology is almost as old as I am. And so you start thinking about it and you're like, it's really not that big a deal. If we could get people to do the right things and make it simpler for them and stop painting this horrific picture that, you know, you need Alfred Einstein's distilled essence working in your cybersecurity policy because nobody cares that much, right? And when everything is that bad, right? When everything is that bad, what ends up happening is people, they revert to the reasonable man argument. I don't know if you guys do any work in law, right? But basically the idea behind, behind tort law is what would a reasonable person do? And if you didn't do that, then you might be negligent. Negligent. Judge Cardoza, best jurist ever. Judge Leonard Hand, actually, in the Cardoza case. Judge Leonard Hand said, it's calculus of neglect, uh, negligence, which says, if the cost of the damage, if the cost of protection is less than the cost of damage times the likelihood. So in other words, if the likelihood, this might happen, times how much damage is gonna happen, is greater than the cost of prevention, you're negligent, ipso facto, right? And my goal is to help people to understand that you can do a bunch of things that are gonna make it a lot less likely, a lot more dangerous, a lot less painful if it actually happens, and that's the right way to go. No, I hate FUD, hate it. And I, cause I think all it does is it scares people into inactivity because so long as everybody's scared and everybody gets breached, Nobody's responsible because a reasonable man knows there's nothing you can do. So, we want to change the essence of the reasonable man hypothesis and say a reasonable person understands if I just do some basic things a little bit better, then I think I'm going to be okay. And that's where we want to get people. Yeah, none of that. No fun, please. And maybe you can't answer this question given what you do, but it seems to me that there are a lot of, I'm from Kentucky, there's a big cyber security hack going on right now at a major healthcare system in Kentucky. It's doing bad things to them. And it seems to me, Equifax hack, a lot of these like huge hacks, it seems that when we talk about responsibility, that there's really not a lot of responsibility. Certainly people aren't going to jail, but, but it feels like that there's not a lot of responsibility taken. There's a lot of hand waving, a lot of, oh, we didn't know this could happen, but that no one goes to jail. If there are fines, they're not that big. Equifax is still around. Yeah, I'm just curious what you think of that. I love this question. And I hope your listeners bear with us, right? Because this has become the cybersecurity hourly, right? Not found of secrets very much. This is part of it. And by the way, for you folks who are watching, listening, this is part of it. Being able to have genuine con conversations with really smart people about things which surround your business is one of the reasons why people will trust you, either to buy from you or to invest in you or to partner with you. It's being able to have real conversations and not just say, and by the way, my product also does this, or my idea is also this cool because. So this is part of it, but I do feel badly. I feel like I'm completely subverting the purpose of the podcast. But so to what the question you're asking, I'm just going to play devil's advocate just for a moment, Taylor. So we'll take, we'll take the Kentucky hospital that I'm not, thank God, not familiar with right now. I will be as soon as I get off this call. <laughs> but who's responsible, right? Is the hospital, is the hospital responsible because, as an example, one of the employees at the hospital opened up an email with a link in it that got them corrupted with ransomware, which then spread virally. Are they responsible for that? Don't think so. They're pretty much there to make people feel better. Okay, so who is responsible? Is that end user? Should we put them in prison? I got an email. They clicked on a link that said I had to click on it. No, I don't think they're responsible. So who is responsible? Some unnamed individual going through a tour server, like way the hell away, right? Okay, go sue them. Good luck. So nobody's going to go to jail because... The nature of cybersecurity is that breaches happen in these gaps, gaps of knowledge, gaps of technology, gaps of understanding. And so these things just happen. Now, there is one place where it can get better. I'm going to flash back 10 to 15 years, right, to the second company. Making the applications better and making the services that support people better and more secure is possible. And if you look, the White House just came out with a directive. The president did it about two or three weeks ago, where it said, oh, and by the way, if you're a vendor, you might be held liable someday soon, right? Now that is a complete sea change, right? Because historically there has been zero liability applicable for software vendors, service vendors, delivering the tools that are later used to violate these other folks. Sorry, so what did the directive say? It, it said that the software vendor? It, it said that vendors, so both software vendors and service vendors may soon be held liable. It's basically, if you want to look in it, it, I forget the number of the section, I'll be happy to send it off to you, Taylor, if you, get, you guys can throw it in the show notes. But it actually talks about the fact that the liabilities for some of these things, we should be incenting people to do a better job of creating more secure services and products. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you can do that is by creating a sense of liability for these folks. 
right? If it actually happened. So I'll forward it off to you. The president has a whole cybersecurity strategy, and this is one way of interpreting a bit of it, but they actually came out and said it again. And it's been pretty interesting to hear people talk about it. So you have a podcast named Pond. Or Pwned. Pwned, sorry. It's a, it's a hacker term. Yeah, it means pwned. that's what you're pwned when somebody takes over your yeah. system and, and owns it. Yeah. And uh, I grew up in Romania. We always said pond. <laughs> we used to play. We used to say it playing computer those, games. You would say pwned. Yeah, those Romanians, they have a different word for everything. Yeah. Doesn't have a lot of vowels. <laughs> anyway, so you actually on a recent podcast talk about how Chat GPT, OpenAI, some of these software applications are black boxes in a way. They don't even know exactly how it works. And, and I think you, you started touching on how do you secure a system like that, right? You're saying, oh, he's, uh, let's make ChatGPT responsible for what it says. And if that proves to be insecure, advice to a programmer to write some code, and then they put the code and the code has some flaws in it with security, then is OpenAI responsible because they didn't validate it before they said it? How, do you, how would you even go about securing something like ChatGPT? I, I love this question as well. You guys are just a font of excellent questions. I'm going to ask you to reflect back to the, I think it was the early 20th century, 1900s in Scotland, the Paisley snail, right? is a famous case of tortious law. And so Stevenson's made ginger beer in dark brown bottles. I have one around here somewhere and they served it up. And there was a young woman and her friend traveling across the area of Paisley in a train and they stop in Paisley and they're going to have a little snack. And so they get a ginger beer and ice cream. They make a little ice cream soda. She drinks some of the soda, yay. And then she pours the rest of it out over her ice cream and in it is a decomposing snail. And she gets gastroenteritis, everybody's very sad, right? And she sues. Now at the time, right, at the time, the only person she could logically sue is the store, right? The place she bought this stuff and put it together, the restaurant, right? Because they were the their proximity, right? They were right, they were right there. They were the people who gave her the thing that made her sick, right? But judges are like, no, dude, that's not right. Stevenson, you're responsible. You were the last person who could look inside that bottle before it was invisible to anyone else. And no, dude, snail, bad, right? And so it's your responsibility. So to your question, if you choose to use chat GPT, excellent. If you choose to use other automation, other generative AI type stuff, you let a large language model decide what the question is, yay. But you're at the end of the day responsible for it. You are, you can't just say, I use chat GPT. That's how you go to a restaurant, right? And they bring out the beef and you get horribly ill. And you're like, dude, I'm horribly ill from this beef. And they're like, yeah, I don't know where it came from. But the guy sometimes picks it up at the side of the road. You ate it. I served it, but I'm not responsible. I got it from him. No, you're responsible, right? You take responsibility for understanding what goes into the software that you're going to deliver to people as though it was healthy for them, right? And that's what we have to do. We have to stop saying that the speed through which I can get more information or the simplicity with which I can build code is somehow more important than it being functional and secure and safe for people. It's not. We don't take it. We would never accept it in airplanes or cars or clothing or medicine or food, but somehow software, which controls all of those systems, yeah, whatever the hell you got is good enough for me. Yeah, that's just crazy. That's just crazy. And so I, my belief is the people who create and profit from the software are responsible for the quality of that final end product. Because frankly, why are they using chat GPT? They're using it because it's easier. It makes development cheaper, makes their engineers have to spend less time. So they're realizing a real cost savings through the application of generative AI. Great, spend the money you would have spent on that, checking it out to make sure it's cool. You'll still have cost savings, but you can take some responsibility for the ultimate impact it has on your clients at the end of the day. I love that. So a couple of quick things before we jet, I, what do you look for? Cause you invest in cybersecurity companies or in companies, mm -hmm. like, what are the kinds of things? And also what kind of advice would you give to people just starting out? But what are the things you're looking for when investing? But I think there's an overemphasis in investing on raising money and all this. So really what advice would you give to somebody who's starting out in cybersecurity or otherwise, but let's say in the tech space. Sure. Specifically, one of the things, one of the questions Jess and I often ask, or the purpose of the questions we ask are to find out how open-minded somebody is. I can tell you you're wrong. I don't care who you are, what you're building, you're wrong. You may be wrong a little bit, or you may be wrong a lot. Don't know. I'm never going to know as much about your business in the first couple of meetings, but you're wrong. And if you don't think you're wrong, and by that, I just mean, you don't say things like, we believe this because of this. Instead, they say, 
this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And when you say, well, how do you know that's the way it is? I've been in the industry for 25 years. I think that's very interesting. What's the market saying now about what you're working on? I really haven't talked to anybody. I don't want to let it out. We're in stealth. How much of the investment are you going to spend in making sure you have good product market fit? Well, we hadn't really thought about that. We really do know, and we think we can help the market understand this is where they should be. That to me is like a massive alarm bell, right? That individual is unlikely to be as flexible as they're going to have to be to have success. You look at some of the great companies in my marketplace and maybe in yours as well, but you look at CrowdStrike, great example, right? So George, Mitri, they're working away. They start off really doing services, figuring out how the systems get hacked, what's all the badness we can look for so we can really quickly identify and help people understand how it happened. And they made the turn and said, wow, if we knew all this stuff really fast, we could stop the attack before it really hurt people. And so they knew their product market fit because they were dealing with the after effects of the events, right? But they were also always thinking about how can they change what they're doing? If you look at the company now, their acquisitions, the work they do, they're always thinking hard about how do we make things better because they're listening. So to me, that's the number one thing. The number two thing is making sure that founders understand whether what they're building is a product or a feature. That's, that is a big thing that people fall down on. And in my industry or any other, that really unique, important value doesn't mean it's a company and it doesn't mean it's a product. It can just be a technology and that's cool too. Good investors will also invest in great technology so long as you recognize the fact you don't have to build the other 90% of the stuff around it to get that one bit of technology into the market. There's partnering, there's licensing, there's integration, there's an open source community, there's a whole bunch of ways you can get things out without investing to develop all the rest of it. That means you're going to have to, because you have excellent, we'll say it's like endpoint malware detection. You've got that, but you don't do any of the other endpoint stuff. You don't have to build all that stuff to be successful. You can build your thing and be smart. And you need to make sure that they get that as well, that they're realistic about what they're building as unique and as awesome as it is. Is it a feature? Is it a product? Is it a company? Three different things. I got to say that a lot of people talk about product and feature and they, they put down features if it's super bad. You're the first person. I love your framing that, hey, just know where you are and then you can work around it or build. Yeah. hundred percent. Dude, people make mayonnaise. Nobody's eating mayo, right? There's a lot of money in mayo. It's not the core product. Right on. But it's a necessary product. Try tuna salad without it. <laughs> may European friend may enjoy it more with olive oil in a little bit. But French fries. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Any kind of final questions? I did have one last question. So your your podcast is the tagline is no bullshit, no excuses. Yep. So it's like a very intense sort of tagline. You have this angry person with a cigar. I'm wondering like- it's, He's just it's, misunderstood. <laughs> what does it mean? Tell us. Yeah. What did we misunderstand? Well, yeah. J Justin and I started- So Justin had been successful doing the podcast for a couple of years before I showed up. And then it had gone- They had stopped doing it for a little while because he was busy. And he said, let's do this again. And we decided what we wanted to do was just tell the truth. If you go to most- most is a strong term. I don't listen to that many of them, but the typical, the archetypal cybersecurity podcast is hacks, users are stupid. I'm a cynic, tools all suck, meh. And that's what they do. And we're like, I'm like, I don't want to do that. I cannot imagine spending time, the amount of hours we spend on the podcast doing that, right? Uh, instead, we just tell the truth. We have our opinions. We all the time say we could be wrong, right? You may have a different opinion, but if you think about the segments that we do, right? Like I love right swipes. Right, swipes kicks ass. That's where we talk about M&A activity in the marketplace, right? And we actually do a real analysis. We'll do a financial analysis. We'll do a market analysis. And we tell what we think is the truth about the companies and their interaction, their likelihood of, or for success or failure. In a similar way, we'll look at breach of the week, right? Sometimes we'll look at breaches and say, what happened? But we're not like, look at how dumb they were. We're like, probably caused by this. If you don't want to get hit by it, try doing this stuff instead. And we are never, ever selling anything. We never sell our stuff. I think Justin mentions us at the end of every show. But mostly what we're doing is we just want to talk constructively about cybersecurity, make the space more approachable, make it more friendly, have a little bourbon, and just get through it. And it's a lot of fun. And a lot of the listenership we've picked up has been people who are excited to hear people talk at a relatively advanced level about cybersecurity, but in words that anybody can understand and about topics that they actually care about. Legislation, governor of XYZ state says something silly. President comes out with a directive that has this goodness and this weirdness in it, whatever. But it's all meant to be just truth. We're not like saying everything's stupid because we're so smart, that's bullshit. And we're not saying everything's great, especially what we do, because that's just stupid. And we're not making excuses when things go bad. We're not making excuses for the way the industry is because the industry just is. And 
the other part is we try not to get into the hype. You asked a great question earlier, like, dude, if you're uncertainty and doubt, why the hell are you doing that? And we don't. And that's because that's cybersecurity. We don't do that. And so the podcast was meant to be a positive twist from two kind of unorthodox individuals talking about cybersecurity. And I'm not sure if you've seen a picture of my partner in crime, the founder, Justin, but Justin has this, but really full, rich beard, massive, like Viking of a man. And I smoke a lot of cigars. And, and honestly, he is this complete Renaissance Viking where he actually came up with that on his own. He does all the artwork for all oh. the things we do. And he's just menacingly good. He's like, I was trying to make it look like you, but then his kids do it. That looks like you. And so there you go. But that's what it is. It, it's meant to just portray. It's also a different angle. Podcasts and cybersecurity can be pretty tense and they can be pretty formal cybersecurity, right? Like a security guard on my Segway, but we're not that either. And I originally said to Justin, I said, is this imagery good? And he goes, you know what? It's who we are. And maybe you guys do the same thing with Founder Secrets, right? But people don't like us, it's fine, screw them. God bless them, everybody has their taste. If we're not their taste, that's great. But should we spend hours of our time trying to be something we're not? Or should we just, no bullshit, just be us? And that's what we do. I love it, I love it. But uh, amazing, we really appreciate your time, Jack. Anything that uh, you, you wanna plug or anything you wanna, you wanna ask of the audience here? Well, first, I want to thank you and thank your audience for paying for pay, spending time here with me. I love what you're doing. You made a mention, Taylor, in one of our early communications that you wish that Founder Secrets had been around when you were founding a company. I can tell you, I would have paid awesome money for Founder Secrets when I was starting my companies because there's nowhere to go. One of the reasons why Justin and I spun up Almana Cyber was to, even if we're not investing, to provide guidance to people, right? So the big goal for us, if we had like a motto, it would be, let us eat the dirt so you don't have to, right? Because Whoever is watching this, who's taking time to do this, I promise you, as smart as you are, you're going to make a mistake I've already stumbled over and suffered the pain for. Let me let my pain keep you from it. So if any of your listeners, through you guys, or come to the Amana site, or just paying us at New Harbor, feel free just to ask questions. I love talking about this, right? My, my goals have expanded, right? I want to protect people. I want to save the world. But if I can save some entrepreneurs some pain so that new technologies or new visions or new value comes into the marketplace, that'd be pretty awesome too. An amazing place to end. Thank you so much, Jack. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Jack. Have Thank you both. Cheers. Thank you for rocking with the homies. Taylor Trusty and Flavio. Seize the day on it. Until next time. Hold it down, hold it down. <laughs>